Grace be to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text upon which we base our meditation today is in Paul's letter to the Roman congregation, chapter 5, verses 12 to 15, the epistle lesson today. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sin. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, be happy to know that our Lutheran Bible camp has a good reputation at Camp Canyon View. They like us. Uh, we get priority even though we're not their biggest customer and therefore we don't bring in the largest amount of money when we rent from them, but we always get priority because they like us. We've been going down there for over 30 years and they're always happy to see us. So I had to ask once in a while, why? Because as camp director, guess what I have to deal with most of the time? The problems, the discipline, and all the other stuff. And he says, well, you don't realize how good your kids are. <clears throat> are we looking about and talking about the same kids that I'm talking about? He says, yes, you just don't understand. He says, your kids are sinners, we understand. They don't do everything right, but he says, you should see the other ones. <laughs> so by comparison, we are great people. Your kids say please and thank you when they go up for food or something like that or ask for something. Or they ask politely, where's the drinking fountain? Or can we go in the gym? Can I go in swimming now or something like that? Can I go up the rope swing? When is the slide going to be open? Some of those things. They ask politely. And we like that. And you're organized. We always know sort of where you're going to be according to your daily schedule. What you're doing, we can keep track of you. You come in on time for dinner and you don't expect us to move stuff around at every whim or something like that. And I get to play sheep's head. There's something good about German stuff. You know, think about how that we do that once in a while. Well, it's the German in us that does this, and it's the German in us that does this, and we sort of say some of the things that are wrong in Lutheran Church because of our heritage, our German heritage. But there are people that actually appreciate our German heritage. This guy never gets to play sheep set unless some Germans show up. And we always let them win to keep the price down. <laughs> that always works. And then the organization, he says, nobody else does stuff like this. And it's like, what? He says, the book you put out. Uh, kids know what cabin they're supposed to be in. They're not running around trying to figure out where they're supposed to be admitting they're lost. You have a daily schedule printed for them. You have rules. <laughs> rules for them. We have KP assignments. Kitchen police for the uninitiated that the kids actually take care of the tables. We have the craft assignments, we have the devotion schedule, we have the Bible study and discussion schedules. And then we throw in all the Bible studies so that the kids just don't get maybe a sheet of paper when the pastor shows up and then who knows what happens. And then they still have a thing at the end which when my daughters started camp they would put down names and addresses so they could write each other. Then that switched to emails. Now we're just up to Facebook, so I don't know if that's as necessary. But we're organized, the German organization of things. But why do we have to have those rules in there? And it's one of the things that I don't say I enjoy on Sunday evenings when we do orientation. And we have all the kids who are excited to be at camp, and the first thing we do is we sit down and we go through the rules. One after another. I won't read them all to you now because that would be cruel and unusual punishment. We have ten of them. I wonder where we came up with that number. Number nine. In keeping with the Spirit of God's Word which says, Love your neighbor as yourself, we will be very careful about doing anything which will cause bodily harm. 
such as throwing sticks or stones, fighting and the like. We will respect one another's property. You will keep your hands off of anything that does not belong to you. Why do we need to tell them that? Because if we don't, they say, I didn't know. Number 10, listen to your counselors. They are your parents for this week. Follow the rules and the schedule. Be friendly, be courteous, be cooperative, and show respect for one another. In short, live as God's children and we will have a great camp. Why do we need that as a rule? Why do we need to read it to them every year? And not just to the rookies. We don't just orientate the rookies. We go through it again for everybody. Because we believe we're sinners. Hi, my name is Gary and I'm a sinner. Welcome to Sinners Anonymous. During the summer, it meets here at Peace Lutheran Church every Sunday at 9.30. I, I, I shake my head when I... I mean, Paul, why does Paul have to say this? Just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sin. Why does he have to remind the Romans? Why do we have to remind ourselves that we're sinners? And you know the answer to that. Because most people don't think they're, they do anything wrong. Have you followed the news that started at the end of June, just about a mile away where that motorcycle cop was shot? Motorcycle cop gets pulled over, or pulls over this person who he sees the, is told on the radio, plates don't match the car, it's stolen. He gets off his motorcycle, cop stops, walk, starts walking to the car, and the driver shoots him seven times. He survives. Bulletproof vest help, Good Samaritans helping, the wound to the neck, and other places. If you followed the paper, did you see a picture of this guy? Shaved head, the tattoos, and everything else. Big, ugly looking guy. I hope I don't say that to him in person. <laughs> he shoots a cop for seven, seven times, and then he takes off, and his passenger at least is like, I don't want to be involved with this. So the passenger grabs the wheel, which is why they have the accident, smashed into the tree, and then they both take off in different directions. The bad guy starts trying to steal somebody else's guard, beats up a couple people, they hit him back, eventually gets caught. So obviously he is incarcerated at this moment. But I loved it when a couple days later there's a comment in the paper of what his wife had to say. Sapp's wife, Leah Sapp, wrote in the comments section on the Columbians website that her husband is not a monster. He is a loving, giving, sweet gentleman, she wrote. Sapp already had a violent criminal history and several felony convictions, the oldest of which dates back to 1988 in Oldham County, Kentucky. He's not a sinner. He's a really nice guy if you just get to know him. Shooting a guy seven times was just a mistake. He didn't really mean it. What? Ah! Why does Paul have to tell the Romans? Probably, well, what was Rome? The, the capital of the kingdom. Highly civilized people. Cultured, caring, loving. Anybody in anything? Ah, <laughs> all the stuff. If you've ever seen any History Channel stuff or any stuff like Gladiator or stuff like that, you can understand the peace-loving country and the capital that it was. You would think they would also be obvious of the fact that, well, maybe we do sin against a holy God from time to time. Paul has to tell them that. And sometimes they might say, like campers say, well, I didn't know that wasn't against I didn't know that was against the rules. I mean, that's what I've had. I've had that at camp. Registration is at 3. Opening service is at 4. Rules are first at 7 o'clock. But about 5 o'clock, somebody's throwing rocks at some other camper. The kid comes in, he's bleeding, he needs that, and we deal with the perpetrator. And the perpetrator said, I didn't know that was against the rules. 
And I know it's my fault. Because we should have read the rules earlier. Because how is a camper supposed to know throwing a rock at some other human being is wrong? Because it wasn't written down anywhere and he didn't have a chance to read page four of his camp book yet. Didn't get that far. Paul understands that. He understands the logic of the people everywhere, let alone Rome, when he says, to be sure, sin was in the world before law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was the pattern of the one to come. Remember, Paul's a lawyer before he got into the ministry. So he understands logic. He understands rational argument. And that's what he's putting here, too. He says, I understand it wasn't written down all the time for many of these things. Adam and Eve had how many commandments when they were created? Come on. Simple command. If you love me, if you love me, leave that tree alone. Everything else is yours. Leave that tree alone. Did God tell them? Yeah. Did they think God was in a conspiracy trying to keep them from being even happier than they were? Yeah, they fell for that lie. And they thumbed their nose at God, rebelled against Him, didn't listen, didn't think. That they thought they knew better. Whatever reason you want to come up with in your head for why they did what they did, but they did it. How many commandments did Moses bring down from Mount Sinai? Trick question. Hundreds! We just know usually the top ten that came down on the tablets. But there were commandments for how to do the Passover. There were commandments on how to celebrate the Day of Atonement. There were commandments on how to do the Feast of Tabernacles. There were commandments for the Pentecost. There were commandments if you get caught stealing one sheep, you pay seven back. There were commandments for if your ox gets out through your fence and gores the neighbors, you have to replace that animal. If it happens a second time, you replace it with more than one animal. And if it replaces the third time, you kill the ox. Those were all the commandments. Why do you think it took 40 days? To get 10 commandments? No. It was all the commandments that brought down. And also, God helped him understand where we came from when God dictated the book of Genesis to Moses. He was busy. He was busy at that time on the mountain, but he had hundreds of commandments that he brought down. How many commandments did Abraham have? None in writing. None. Was he commanded to leave the tree of life alone? I mean, the tree of good and evil and knowledge? No, because they couldn't get to it anymore. Why? I like doing this at camp, because kids will come up with the answers like, because the angels are guarding it. Uh, you forget the flood. That's all gone. It wasn't there anymore. There was no tree of knowledge of good and evil. There was no tree of life. There was no Garden of Eden. I love that when the Iraq war starts, because they're going to still try and find maybe the Garden of Eden. So they didn't have that commandment to worry about. Moses is still in the future. How many commandments did Abraham have? None. None in writing. None written down. None told him by God. Did Abraham, did Paul still consider Abraham to be a sinner? Oh yeah. Points out many of Abraham's sins. Points out also his greatness when we, and Paul did that earlier in this letter, when he talked about the greatness of Abraham, not because of his works, not because of his lack of sin, but because of his childlike faith and trusting that God loved him, cared about him, and had a promised Savior coming in the future. That's what we're supposed to also emulate about Abraham. When Paul says, well then how did they die? Because the wages of sin is death. You don't die unless you're a sinner. All those people still die. Yeah, they were sinners. Not because they broke some written code or went against some written rules. It's because we know and have been told right and wrong in our hearts. Children know it. You don't have to tell them rules when they know they're doing something wrong once in a while. You see it in their eyes. Pretty early in life. I'm sad to say it's already been seen in my grandson's eyes. He knows when he's... And it could be something simple. We're down at the fort. We're sitting on our sand chairs. One of the adults gets up, he hops in and smiles. 
Now, it's not a great crime. Not a big sin. But he knows he just stole somebody else's chair. He's not even two yet. That's not supposed to happen until next month. We have an old Adam in us that we try and deny. Or we say little things, neat things about him like, oh, he's the little guy who's dressed in the funny underwear and stuff like that. And he's not really a big deal, that little devil on our shoulder who's tempting us. It's sort of a funny thing. And sometimes we don't take Satan as seriously as we should. Oh, it's one thing when the people were referring to Jesus as a servant of Satan, a certain of Beelzebub, and Jesus warned him, you're going to be called that too, even when you're trying to do some good things. That you're in league with Satan because you've got these powers to do these things to help people, and you're going to be called a deceiver and not following the true word. But again, those are names. I, with these words again this morning, need to remind myself of how corrupt the human race has become since that first sin. And how much it has messed everything up. See, sometimes there's that idea, Adam and Eve sinned and they sinned and they did something wrong and everything else stayed the same. No, they messed up the whole planet. The whole planet was messed up because of their rebellion. The perfection of God's creation was completely messed up. The whole little thing came with that condemnation. If you eat of this fruit, you will die. And from that point on, the aging process kicked in. And tell me that's not a bugger. I mean, I joke about little things. Hair falling out. Glasses coming on. Going to the doctor and asking him to look at certain spots on my back that my wife once checked. And he says, oh, those are just barnacles. He says, I can give you the fancy Latin word for them, but they're barnacles. Would you like the bigger ones frozen off? Yes, please. <laughs> aging process. You can think of your own things that you don't like about the aging process. Is it going to get better? No, not here. Think of how the animal world is messed up. Wouldn't you like to go to a zoo and just pet all the animals? Go in by that lion. Give him a big hug. Hop on the back of a tiger. Just be cool. Adam and Eve could do that. The only time I've ever seen people do that is in these circus things. Or what's that old TV show, Doc Tari, with the cross-eyed lion? Boy, that dates me. Or Gentle Ben with the big bear? Imagine being like a two-year-old who goes up to a dog that's about the same size that he is and just gets licked and everything else, and you do that with a lion, a tiger, or a cougar. Because there's no sin in the world. I couldn't think of like this, imagine that with a dinosaur. You know, I could think of it was Dino from the Flintstones, for an analogy there. And maybe that show about the dinosaurs where the baby says, not the mama, not the mama, that was a short-lived show, but that was on there too. Imagine riding a big Tyrannosaurus Rex because they're friendly. And there's no animosity. How the world was cursed. And Paul talks about in other parts of this letter to Romans 2 about how the planet is groaning because of what sin has done to this earth. What's happened to the plant world? Imagine no weeds. All the dandelions are in the right place. You want dandelions? They're all over there. They're pretty yellow, pretty white, and they stay there. They're not in the middle of your lawn. Little and all the other junk that's out there. Mosquitoes that have another purpose than biting you. The microbiological world. I don't know how that all got messed up. The gene world, I know. I can see that. I can see evidence of the gene world getting messed up. The way genes don't replicate the way they're supposed to, where they get out of control with cancer. Imagine all of that not being with us because of sin. And Paul reminds us we let these things... No, he puts it more like God put these things here to remind us, you want something better. Paul doesn't get into all this like, see what your sin has done, see what your sin has done, but more like, see what sin has done in general and how terrible things are so that you can get maybe a, an imagination going 
into how awesome it's going to be when God fixes it all. And we're in heaven. And that's why he says, The gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? In hymns today, everybody fell along with Adam's sin. We're going to finish with amazing grace. But also thinking about not just the fact that I'm saved. We looked at that with previous sermons and it'll be again coming up soon. And hopefully I never leave it out of a sermon. That you and I get to go to heaven because of a simple childlike faith that God loves us and keeps his promises. That if we believe Jesus died for our sins, we get to go to heaven. Because Jesus paid for all that sin. The sins that we do on purpose, the sins we do by accident, the sins of commission, the sins of omission. He's covered all of that. And usually that's a nice cliche with us. All our sins are covered. We know we get off the hook because sins have been taken away. But I remind myself with what Paul's talking about here is how awesome heaven's going to be. And I wish he gave me more details. I wish he gave me more little bits of information. Because I don't like just using my imagination to think about what it would be awesomely like. That he not only took away my sins, he's going to glorify my body. How good am I going to look? How good are you going to look? And I know I won't care about the actual appearance, like whether I can be on the front of a magazine or not. But that the problems I have will be gone. Now you 10 year olds, you're not there yet. You're still developing most of your problems. They're coming, I'm sorry. Those of you in your 20s are starting to get an idea. Those of you in your 50s can identify with me. And those of you in your 80s are telling me, just wait. Just wait. They're nothing yet when you're in your 50s. I understand. In heaven, it'll all be gone. We'll be glorified. All of us will be glorified in our body. Our souls will be glorified. That I need to use my imagination on too. All of us are going to be perfectly behaved. Imagine being a camp director at a camp where all the children need none of the rules because they would be so obvious. They're all loving and caring towards each other. Nobody takes somebody else's pillow. Nobody else puts ketchup in somebody else's sleeping bag. Nobody does any of these things to anybody else because of the fact that they love their neighbor as themselves. Heaven! We love our neighbor as ourselves. We won't gossip in heaven because there won't be anything to gossip about. We won't slander in heaven because there won't be anything to slander about. We won't say, I wonder what that person's thinking about me. I mean, it could be little things. I got some new clothes from Penny's. They weren't selling the same socks I always used to buy, the Stafford White Crew Socks. So I had to buy some other socks, these gold toe socks. And then I couldn't find my shirt, my short sleeve white shirts that I wear, so I had to get some different type of short sleeve shirts. So this morning, Lynn noticed that the short sleeve shirts are a little longer, and the white socks are a little taller. So I realized I'm really not losing weight from exercise, I'm shrinking. Very deceptive. But I won't care about looks. My daughters won't have to dress me. They won't care either. Because then all that will be important anymore. We'll have our priorities straight. But I'll feel good. My soul will be good. And he's going to take me to a place where everything and everyone is perfected also. And I thought of that. What would it be like to be a camp director in heaven? where there are no problems, there are no issues, everybody's working together, we're all having fun, all of that. But I thought, 
you know, I've got to think of that differently. Just as I've said before, <laughs> well, there's jokes about it. Are there lawyers in heaven? <laughs> if you really hate lawyers, they never make it. <laughs> but there's lawyers in heaven. Are there doctors in heaven? They don't have to do anything. Are there pastors in heaven? They won't have to do anything. Are there camp directors in heaven? No, they won't have to do anything. What will I be when I get to go to heaven? A camper! A camper! Everybody's going to take care of me. The food will get delivered? I go swimming? I can play ball? I can hang out? And parents maybe will come pick me up. <laughs> that would don't have to worry about that. But just being at camp again where everything else is taken care of and there's no mosquitoes and there's no huge spiders in the shower, there's nothing else to worry about. It's just awesome. And I'm hanging out with friends. Friends I like, friends who like me. And there's not this, I wonder what they're thinking about me because you don't have to worry about it. Everybody likes everybody else. Nobody's judging anybody else. Nobody's picking on what socks you have on, what sandals you have on, whether you're wearing sandals with socks, any of that other stuff. None of that is being judged. Because we're all like we would like to be, and so is everybody else. And that's why Paul, yes, he highlights the sin here to remind ourselves we don't want to take it lightly, but he also highlights it in such a way to remind ourselves you and I have been slumming so long in this world that we can't really imagine how different it's going to be in heaven when everybody is just nice. But he does want us to think about it because that's also what Jesus did. He didn't just take our sins away, but he gave us this hope, sure hope, this promise we'll have a fantastic life. And God the Father did that even for Adam and Eve right at the first sin. After they had sinned, and he came in the garden. First, like, where are you? <laughs> Why were you hiding? You know, all the parent-type questions you ask to give the chance a child, to, the child a chance to confess ahead of time. But his first thing is not, this is what's going to happen to you. The first thing is, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to put hatred between you and that guy who caused this problem, the devil. And in the future, somebody's going to crush his power but he's going to wound that person during that process. But you, Adam and Eve, trust me. Believe in me. Put your faith in me. You will have the gift of eternal life. Paul's saying, let's just do that same thing. Trust God. Put our faith in Him. And maybe, since we do believe it, love Him back. And act accordingly. Amen. Please arise. May the love of God, which he has for you and for me, and which goes beyond our understanding, keep your hearts and your minds focused on Christ Jesus. Amen.